Well, good afternoon, everybody, and a happy new year. It's been a minute. When was the last time we were here? It was like the week before the week yes. before Christmas. Yeah, mid mid December. Mid December. Dave, how are you? Yeah, it's been a while. I haven't even seen you for a bit. I was just trying to remember how to do this. It's been a it's 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 been a couple of minutes, but uh, yeah. we we got through the intro. We're here. We're live. Everybody's happy and healthy and <laughs> some degree. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> And uh, we made it, guys. So it's so good to be back. We're, we're really uh, we're stoked. We missed you all. And I hope that everybody had a wonderful holiday season, wonderful new year, and is back in the swing of things and staying uh, very safe and very healthy. Um, a lot of people in the comments already who are really looking forward to this particular uh, episode. Um, and what a way to start the new year. Um, let's get let's, moving on our, on our guest today. Um, he is a pioneer of the five-string banjo style known as the melodic claw hammer. He is considered one of today's top claw hammer players, known in particular for his skillful adaptations of uh, Celtic, Appalachian, and Canadian fiddle tunes in this particular style. As well as touring throughout most of the English-speaking world, he is a recording artist, a banjo camp director, and an author of multiple widely used and highly recommended instructional books. His latest recording is called Frails and Frolics, and while his, uh, his latest instruction book is named Appalachian Fiddle Tunes for Clawhammer Banjo. Ladies and gentlemen, let's kick off the new year in style and please welcome Mr. Ken Harmon. Hey, hi folks. Hey, Ken. <laughs> hey, glad to, glad to be here. Well, it's going pretty, pretty good in this time of COVID, so we're... Staying yeah. close to home, but uh, trying to project online. Project positivity. Where, where is home right. for you? It is Boston. Oh, okay. is it? Cool. But, and Boston proper. So. Ah, very nice. Dave, Dave, you're from Boston, aren't you? I grew up in high school years in Boston, yeah. yeah. Oh, cool. And yeah. took my first, uh, first banjo lessons in uh, Porter Square. Oh, cool. When, yeah. uh, when Music Emporium was in, was there in Porter Square. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm, I'm a New Yorker going back and uh, moved to, I moved to Boston in the 80s. Wow. Yeah, it's a cool city. Dave, yeah. uh, Dave gave me the grand tour about three years ago, and uh, it was awesome. It's a wonderful place. I can't wait to go back. But uh, Well, I hope you're safe and I hope you're well, and thank you so much for your time today, and, and thank you for joining us, and uh, hopefully we can hang out for the next hour and, and talk things banjo, but... Yeah, As is true, to in traditional Deering lifestyle, would you mind kicking off with a, sure. a little tune? Okay, I'm going to play uh, a couple of tunes that uh, I got from uh, a great West Virginia fiddler named Bobby Taylor. And he's a fourth generation fiddle player and uh, learned a lot of the old tunes. And uh, this is a, it's going to start off with a version of uh, a tune called Folding Down the Sheets that he uh, kind of uh, reworked and uh, made more interesting than the version most people know. Okay. And, uh, and then the second tune is uh, called uh, The New Five Cents. So here we go. Awesome. Thank you. 
All right. That's, that was great. Thank you. Um, it's great to have you on the show. I've, we've never met, but uh, um, my, I think my first banjo book had you, you were on it. It was, uh, it was a mixture. I forget. It was like five string banjo styles. It was red. It had Tony Trishka and Pete Wernick. I think yourself. Miles oh. Preston was in it. Um, oh. It was, yeah. But so for, sure? <laughs> I, I've, I've, I've been familiar with you since. Uh, okay. I, th I think it was, it was like it had it had banjo players to check out kind of in it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't remember that particular book. Yeah. But I'm sure it's. So I've been aware of you since, you since my beginnings and uh, always, always been fond of your style. Thank you. You, I've always come kind of known of you as the melodic claw hammer um, pioneer and and, uh, and and player. And is that accurate? And and what would you? How would you describe what melodic claw hammer playing is? Well, um, uh, from from my point of view, it's um, treating the banjo like a uh, uh, a serious instrument and uh, uh, just trying to take the take uh, melodies and uh, you know squeeze all the life and uh, feeling out of them rather than just playing approximations in other words the uh, the, the tune dictates the the phrasing and the melody the tune dictate the arrangement rather than uh, the banjo uh, what's easy to do on the banjo dictating the arrangement and did you were inspired to kind of take up this this style in, in from three finger melodic players like like Bill Keith and Bobby Thompson? Well, um, they are certain. Well, Bill Keith is certainly in in the chain of of development. Um, more uh, in the sense of my being aware of what he did, but uh, I uh, started playing. Well, I started playing fretted instruments um, on guitar. So I, I, my first few years, I played just guitar. And then uh, in college, it, this was Cornell uh, in Ithaca in, in the late 60s and early 70s. So uh, there were uh, quite a number of people who were moving in that direction, uh, one of which was uh, Howie Burson, who uh, he was maybe two or three years ahead of me in development and, and I heard his style and I, I was really intrigued by it and and then Walt Koken was in the area and Walt doesn't think of himself as a melodic player but he you know in effect he sure was and uh, and then and there were there were others that most uh, you know that never really uh, pursued a professional career as a, as banjo players but but they were uh, excellent players who were local and that I heard. And so uh, right from the start, playing tunes in Clawhammer style was what I wanted to do. And uh, um, uh, I often tell this story. Um, there was, uh, uh, in the early 70s, there was kind of a, a weekly jam session at a place called the Unmuscled Ox in Ithaca, and, and it was like a, a little coffee house run by a religious organization. So once a week, people would gather there and play tunes, and it was, and there was no distinction then between Southern tunes and New England tunes and Irish tunes. People just played tunes, and uh, and they would often. Uh, so I'd play along on the few that I knew, or I'd play chords and. Every once in a while, people would turn to me and say, oh, you don't have to play on this one because everyone knows that you can't play uh, this kind of, you can't play jigs on claw hammer, you can't play devil's dream in claw hammer, or you mm -hmm. can't play this other tune in claw hammer. And I would nod my head and then I would go home and, and you know, spend a lot of time trying to figure things out and say, oh, wait a minute, you can do it. <laughs> so, That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, so that that's how it all started. At first, it was like a puzzle and a game, and then it became like just something that I loved, and, and uh, I just got a lot of satisfaction out of. And 
and so to, when you're figuring out how to play a you know a jig or a reel or, or something you know with a heavy melody uh how did you how did you how did you just kind of how did you kind of first figure out some techniques to to get that to get all those notes down in that style oh well that's a really good question um well at, at first i would try I mean, not every time, but there were a lot of tunes I would play and I would have all of the notes and I would say to myself, I'm playing all the notes, it doesn't sound like the tune. Right. It doesn't sound like the tune. And then uh, finally I met uh, a piper who's actually, by, he's no longer with us. His name was Bill Oakes, or now later he referred to himself as Ox. Um, and, and he wasn't, uh, he was only, uh, had been playing pipes a few years, but um, his, he would just stress the idea of phrasing, that it's where the tune takes a breath and how you organize the, well, it would be one thing on the pipes, but on a fretted instrument, it, it's how you organize the tune so that um, uh, the notes fall in such a way that you can grab them and shape the tune so that it flows, like the ones that I played. So, what I, uh, watch what I'm doing with my uh, thumb of the right hand. I'm exaggerating. Dum da dee da da ba da 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 ba dum. So um, that's that's like uh, super important, to, you know, shaping the tune and making it sound like the tune. Because all of these tunes are dance music, so they have to have a certain level of liveliness. And uh, one thing that is relatively consistent is that uh, the the uh, the breaths come. Uh, before the upbeat or pickup of a given phrase and lead to a strong note thereafter. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm kind of exaggerating, but that's, mm -hmm. that, that's how you make it sound like a tune. And when it came to uh, jigs, um, I, I remember um, think, thinking, okay, well, s some things are, uh, you know, you can do this pretty easily. That's six, eight time. And then you can stick hammer-ons or pull-offs in the middle. So there's kind of one, one thing you know, what do you do if you need, uh, how do you get the thumb involved? And uh, what I learned is to do uh, a figure like this, where I'm doing uh, um, down, uh, down, thumb down, down, thumb down. And, and the reason that works again is phrasing, because you're leading from the last note of each uh, three note group to the first note of the next one. So it's da da ba da da ba da 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 da. That's that's interesting on the phrasing. I don't think um, that's that's talked about enough. Where a lot of banjo players are doing what you're initially doing. They're just playing. They're playing the notes, but it's not really sounding musical yet. Um, right. Well, well, that's why and, uh, that's why melodic claw hammer often has a bad reputation. Like fiddlers will say, "Well, the banjo player, uh, I can't learn the tune from the banjo player." I, I, sometimes I can't even recognize the tune from the banjo right, player. Right. Um, and then they'll say, well, except for you. <laughs> and, and, and maybe they're just flattering me, but, but I, would like to think, I, would, I would like to think that that was true. And, and, I, and I'm not alone. There are a lot of other very fine um, 
melodic players, most of whom refuse to use the, refuse to consider themselves as such. But <laughs> so, so, I mean, you you talk about phrasing a lot when you're playing, um, like a jazz solo or or a rock solo. You, you know, your solo, you you talk about phrasing because you leave gaps. But in a lot of fiddle music. You know, like in bluegrass and old time, there isn't the built-in phrase. It's 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 a lot of it's a heavy stream of notes. So that's, um, a lot of the time, but and I think that's where it gets lost. Like in a you know in a in a in a Miles Davis solo, there's very clear phrases and then very clear breaths. But with fiddles, with stringed instruments, there's a, there's a lot of notes. But I think with can you talk about what you listen for in phrasing from a fiddle player and what they might, what, what do you hear in that? Is it, is it, is it a rhythmic act? Is it an accent of just a note being accented or is it a rhythmic timing thing or is it a blend of the two? Kind of? Oh, well, th those are really, really good questions. Um, let me, let me uh, just tell you one story, which is, um, uh, I spent uh, a fair amount of time with a great Scottish fiddler named Angus Grant. Huh. And um, Angus said, well, first of all, he said that uh, any, um, any fiddler worth his salt could take the same melody and play it as a march, strass bay, reel, jig, or slow air. <laughs> and then he said, and in fact, um, you don't really, you can't, if you could take a reel and play it as a slow air, then you would really understand it. And, and what he meant was um, that there, uh, there, when you're playing a slow air, you sort of accentuate the breaths in the phrases. Mm -hmm. So even it might be a stream of notes, but there'll be uh, a, a place where you kind of expand um, the space between phrases. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you play, if you take that tune and speed it up, it's like you're still hearing the space between the phrases, but the, but, but the, but the space has in fact disappeared. And what you're, what right. you're actually doing is it's, you're changing direction. Is there any way you could take a, a simple melody and and show us an example of, of that of using playing it in a different kind of style like you just said? Oh, uh, uh, sure. Uh, well, I, I was kind of doing that, but um, um, so uh, let, let's just go back to uh, folding down the sheet. So sure. Uh, so the the melodies. did it all with downstrokes just so I, I wasn't uh, kind of um, cheating so that that's the melody but it, it um, so the, the idea is usually uh, in a reel uh, and there are many um, there are many uh, variations or many uh, changes to this pattern but in a reel the uh, penultimate um, note, um, the, the, the last note in a measure, uh, generally leads to the first of the next measure. And also, like if you have a series of four note groupings, the last note of any given group leads to the next group. But sometimes it's not one note, sometimes it's two. So for example, at the start of um, folding down the sheets, um, there are actually two pickup notes, so it's, and then you have, so it's, so it's one and two and three, so between and and three, you're sort of leading with the thumb and you, so you're changing direction. I often think of that um, <clears throat> Kate Wolf song, uh, The Great Divide, where the, the, the this is where the, not where the rivers change direction, but where the music changes direction. Um, and, and to think of it as a 
slow era. of your mind and you're directing your uh, usually you're, you're sort of waiting the that's with a w e i g h t you're waiting <laughs> hand so that um, the, the thumb kind of picks up exactly the right um, spin on the string to make it sound like it's moving in a different direction yeah that's, does that that's make, good does that make sense? Yeah, it <laughs> makes sense. Totally makes sense. It's, it's very good. Um, one thing that you know, as you're talking about doing it, you know, you know, changing the rhythm and of the of the melody. One thing that I have problems with is when you know that the usual flow is for the for the finger to hit the down strokes and the thumb to hit the up the upbeats in the standard kind of like alternate, you know. But there's times when the thumb has to hit a down beat. Um, do you do that? And when you're changing up, it seems like when you're changing up the, the rhythm that sometimes you, you were forced to do that. Um, well, or, sometimes. Or how do you get the note if you, if you, how do you get the note if you're on, you know, if you're going the wrong direction, but you need to get that, you well, know, like the strings below you or something. Yeah, well, you know, there's, uh, there's this one uh, technique um, um, some people call it a Galax lick, um, yeah. you know, where you're dragging the string. So you strike the string and you just keep going without a fresh wrist string. Right. And, and that, um, that uh, kind of leads into a whole area of... Um, um, what I, what I call arpeggios, because mm -hmm. arpeggios are, um, well, there are two meanings of arpeggios. One is a broken chord, and right. when it comes to a stringed instrument, it means you're just playing a, a sequence of open st of strings, um, so, it, so you can do it with three strings or four, so you could go... bringing in the, up the rear with the thumb there. And, um, and sometimes, uh, uh, I'm, I'm probably getting off the subject here, but sometimes I'll actually get an upstroke by, by using the back of my fingernail as a pick. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, it kind does. I know that it's in the vein, and that you know, I know there's a lot of different techniques to get those right troublesome notes in the, in there. You know, not the ones that are just straight, um, kind of an alternate picking um, right. style. And, and then there's the whole uh, uh, subject of syncopation, which is like uh, quite an extensive <laughs> area, <laughs> right? Right, in, right, in right. Itself, right. and you know, I, I've kind of come up with a whole system for. Um, achieving different common syncopations without breaking stride can you can you show us what without getting too deep into it can you sh kind of show us one example sure well um you know it's all based on uh, what i call a skip stroke other people call it a ghost brush so you're starting with something like this so instead of Then you, you mm -hmm. do where you skip. So you're that's based on so and then you could do. So. 
So let, me stop, let me stop you there. The side, yeah. I just sticking right there on your right hand. Could you just show us like an exercise for somebody to practice that? You know, just with just sure. an open, Absolutely. you know, nothing going on the left hand. Okay, so well, so you would do one. You can pick any combination of right hand pattern. Like you could do one, two, one, five, and do two of them. And then you can skip various places, so you could do, or you could do, uh, or you could do, and, and turn that into. Okay. And then ultimately you can do things like <laughs> and and what I'm doing there and and I'll actually be playing a piece later uh, that uses this but I'm actually crossing the thumb over to the first string and then coming back and, and that's again so that you get the phrasing to sound right. So the thumb was playing the first string and then the fifth string? Uh, well, I alternate. Okay, here I am at the fifth and I do a skip and bring the thumb all the way down to the first string and then the, sec uh, the picking finger comes back to the second. Okay. And the reason is okay. because this note is le supposed to lead to that one. Gotcha. So it's yeah. kind of counterproductive, but that's the way it, it sounds like ragtime. Yeah, yeah. Well, do you want to play another tune for us right now? Sure. Um, What tune is this, and what tuning are you going into? Well, I'm going to stay in double C. And I just took the, I got rid of the capo. And, and this is a, a Dallas rag. So, yes. and uh, uh, so uh, with some vari original variations and uh, the third time through, I uh, go to F, and it turns out the the very first recording of this tune was in C, and then uh, Bob Wills um, popularized it in F. But, so here we go.
There, forgot to, yeah, my bad. Forgot to unmute my mic. <laughs> That's fantastic. Thank you. So you said that, that move to the, to the key of F? Yes. So how do you get some of those notes out of double C? What is there? Oh, is there... well, you know, it's actually fairly easy to play in um, F and double C. You would go there. Kind of like that. It's all there. Do you practice scales in, in, um, in all of the, in different tunings? Um, sometimes, you know, sometimes years later, <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, I figured this out, so maybe I should systematize it. But, but it, um, I, I like playing an F in uh, double C tuning because it's a very, you get a very, a uh, lot of rich um, tonality. <laughs> So would you practice, would you suggest like taking a melody that you already know, like you, like you just did and moving it to a different key? Well, you can do that. Although actually uh, that's Fisher's hornpipe, of course. Right. And that's the original key. Oh, wow. So um, I, I got inspired to uh, learn it in F by listening to uh, a great Cape Breton fiddler named Winston Fitzgerald. Uh -huh. And uh, so it, uh, and and then uh, and then of course you can uh, uh, just for fun you can medley going back and forth between you know with the same melody just doing yeah. uh... So it's it's kind of fun, and, and then and then you can inspire the fiddle players and say, "Hey, let's do this." You know, when when I uh, wor worked with uh, Alan Jabour for all those years, we used to kind of do things like that to push each other. Right, right. Have you mainly worked? Have you played in string? In you know tr more traditional you know Appalachian style string bands, or have you mainly worked solo and, and with fiddlers you know uh, in small group of you know situations? Well, um, <clears throat> well, back in the um, in the late seventies <clears throat> and early eighties, uh, uh, when I was living in New York, uh, I was in a couple of uh, local string bands. Uh, one was called Fly by Night, and the. the <laughs> And the other was the the Metropolitan Opry, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, you know basically, um, and I, I learned an awful lot of, about music. But um, um, I got to work for fifteen years with um, a great Appalachian style fiddler, Alan Jabour. Are you familiar with mm -hmm. Alan's work? You know, I'm, not. I'm not. Okay. So. Well, uh, his collecting activities back in the 60s uh, from several fiddlers, uh, most notably a West Virginia fiddler named Henry Reed. They it launched the Old Time Music Revival. So it was his group, the Hollow Rock String Band, that was um, the one that inspired everyone. And, and then very quickly there were a host of others um, who um, um, kind of jumped into the fray. but. Um, uh, playing with him was a great experience because um, you know he had learned di directly from the old timers and um, had a, a very um, just beautiful take on the music that I, I enjoyed falling in with. And when you're playing with a fiddle player, what is your role as the banjo player? Are you are you are you playing you know? The melody with them in unison, or are you, or are you, um, you know, playing playing it like a counter melody, or or, or something else. 
Uh, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, when well, it depends on the player. Um, yeah. Because um, it, you have to have a, a fiddle player who's willing to uh, listen to what people around him are doing and adjust. Mm -hmm. um, and not, not everyone is capable of, of doing that. But when I played with Alan, um, he was, you know, if I changed the, the harmony slightly, you could hear him adjusting the tone on his fiddle. I mean, it was... Um, it was great, but uh, so yeah. So if if I was going to be playing with a fiddler that that was open to having this type of um, banjoist work with him, uh, I would play uh, unison. That's you know straight melody. Sometimes I would uh, play a, a chordal background. Sometimes uh, I would play uh, counter melody. Sometimes I'd try. I'd play harmony. Sometimes. You know, I, I just try to uh, make a very uh, varied um, okay. approach to to working with that fiddle player. It would be more like a, a partnership than an accompaniment. Right. And if you're, what if you're in a, a jam situation, um, you know, you, and you're the only banjo player, let's, let's say, but there are three fiddle players or something, and, you know, a lot of guitar players. Um, well... If I'm the only banjo player, then uh, I can pretty much do what I want. <laughs> right, right, yeah. As long as it fits. Uh, the problem is when there's at least you know two or three other banjo players, and then uh, uh, sometimes in those circumstances, most of what I would be doing would be uh, it would just create cacophony. So maybe I'll play mostly straight melody. Uh huh. Okay. But. But, uh, um, but as I, opposed I just, to falling back on just playing like straight harmony to make it simple that way, you'd, you'd, you'd straighten um, it out by, by playing the melody straight. Well, if I'm playing straight harmony, I mean, that's would, assuming there was a guitar player there, they would, yeah, that would, it would kind of get lost. So, True. you know, I mean, part of uh, enjoying the jam session is being able to hear, hear yourself and hear how you blend in with um, other people. And, are there any more um, tips for people that are playing, you know, going into a jam session and they're playing, you know, playing claw hammer banjo, what they should be listening for, how they should approach it? Well, um, there, there's sort of a, a, an, an approach that's grown up and, um, you know, I, I had a long, you probably know who, uh, Brad Leftwich. Um, mm -hmm. I, had a, I had a long talk with Brad at one point and, he refers to it as as a festival style, uh, where you know basically people kind of um, hunt, you know, they sort of hunt and peck for a little bit of the melody, and and uh, and then if you have a, a bunch of banjo players, each one is kind of hunting and pecking for a different part of the melody. Um, so it, um, but um, you know, just um, you know. Listening a lot to the music, learning the tunes. Um, if you don't know the tune, um, you, you know, uh, try to f find notes here or there. Um, but um, but above all, you know, kind of make a note of what the tune was, and maybe in the next, you know, if you really like the tune, then you know, learn it. Um, that's probably about the best. I can do on that. Sure. Um, so, what are some what are some common tunings you use? You said you're you know using double C tuning, and um, what yeah, are, I use, are there other tunings? Yeah, I use double C. I use G and uh, the G modal mostly. Uh -huh. uh, l lately, I've kind of embarked on a little project, um, and, and and before we're done, uh, um, I, I hope you'll ask me about my. Uh, uh, collecting in the in the Maritimes, uh, Canadian Maritimes. But uh, I've embarked on a project lately of uh, uh, notating uh, roots um, banjo players' um, recordings, note for note, and and that's been a lot of fun. And and uh, they use uh, quite a number of tunings that I'm I'm 
becoming more familiar with um, like uh, you know open detuning and uh, uh, kind of a G modal tuning with a fifth string tuned down a step um, and um, um, uh, Cumberland gap tuning and you, you know just you know bunches of others and so that that's been a lot of fun. All right. Um, uh, th this this project has been uh, particularly interesting because of all the mythology that has, is floating around the old time scene about what the old timers did and didn't do. Uh, for ex for example, um, I've heard oh the old timers never used drop uh, they never used double thumbing. Well, they all used it, <laughs> and uh, but you know they used it on limited string usually. Um, unlimited string in limited combinations but they used mm -hmm. it all the time or oh they never used the alternate string pull-offs well they all used it all the time uh, both for rhythmic effect and, and for melody you know, it's, and so you know it, it's just kind of um, interesting that way how do you think some of these you know in traditional music there's so many um, I play various styles of traditional music. In traditional music, there's always these sort of ideas that, of how things were done originally That's that right. are often not right or unimportant yeah. if, you know, today. Um, yes. uh, how, what do you think about having just have, you know, the, like the, the, especially the argument of they didn't do it that way, so you can't do it this way? Um, you know, is that. Is it is it important or you know and 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 how do you how do you develop the sounds you know for yourself as opposed to just trying to rehash what you heard on a on a record somewhere? Well, I, I guess there's a, a couple of aspects to it. Uh, one is that no, of course, um, uh, you can go beyond what the old timers did, especially right. in a field like Clawhammer where the old timers were, I won't say they, they were wonderful players, but they were very limited in terms of what, how far they took the technical capabilities of, of mm -hmm. the style, uh, e even compared to uh, the, uh, the old uh, uh, stroke style banjoists of the minstrel era. You know, they, they only did a few things, but they did it very, very well. Right. Uh, however, um, the current um, mythology of the, in the old time scene, it it it, it uh, it's even more more limited. Like, right. you know, so so and uh, and they'll say, oh well, the old, as I was saying before, oh the old timers never did double thumbing. Well, they did it all the time, but it it's true that they it was limited. They usually there were three options that they would use. Usually it was uh, one, two, one, five, or one, two, two, five, or very frequently one, two, three, five. And they often did, they often did uh, alternate off string, alternate string pull-offs. And I've heard, oh yeah, well, the old timers never, never used that, so you can't use it. Um, but uh, in in any any style of music, uh, a, a real a real folk instrument, uh, an approach to a real folk instrument, it, it really means that okay, anything is possible. And one uh, um, one story I like to tell is um, I was um, I, I was watching a uh, a performance in Greenwich Village of a wonderful guitar player named Eric Franzen. And he was playing a ragtime piece, and and uh, I guess the the treble was up around the twelfth fret, but the bass note that he wanted was down here, so he leaned over and got it with his nose. <laughs> and you could say, well, heck, that's not traditional, but <laughs> well, it is traditional because it's traditional in that uh, uh, playing. Uh, a non-classical instrument means that uh, the rules are that you find what uh, the techniques that you need to express the uh, musical ideas that you have. 
Right. Yeah. I agree. I, I agree totally. Um, getting a little bit into some specifics, do you about uh, just like nails versus picks on your right hand? Um, oh, oh, okay. What do you, yeah, what do you do over there? Oh, well, uh, <laughs> um, okay. Back uh, in the in the seventies, I had been playing maybe close to 10 years and, and, uh, uh, this is the late seventies. And, and I, I kept having the, the problem of the center of my nail wearing out. <clears throat> and <clears throat> there was a guy named Ray Alden who was uh, instrumental in bringing the round peaks, um, sound to New York city. And, and he used to, what he, he did, he took a piece of adhesive tape, and he taped, he cut a piece of flat pick and he taped the piece of flat pick to his hand and, you, and he used that as a, um, to pluck the strings and that way you wouldn't have to worry about his nail breaking. Yeah. And I tried that and it didn't work for me uh, for one reason or another. And, yeah. uh, but the idea of tape was in my mind. So I was walking along one day and I thought, gee, what if I took a piece of scotch tape and, and I uh, surrounded my nail with it, um, would it work? And I said, no, it'll never work. And, and it was like, well, why not try it? <laughs> what have you got to lose? So I did. And for, you know, ever since then, this is the way I protect my nail. So I take a piece of scotch tape and uh, I have... Uh, I, I leave a little bit hanging over the edge. I don't know if you can see that, mm -hmm. but then I tuck it under. And this is what I do with my nail. And, and of course, wow. you know, you, ha you, you have to file Change it, it and out. keep it smooth. And yeah, so every time I, yeah. I, pre I, you know, and if it wears down, you just replace it. But at least your nail isn't wearing down. It never wears through during, you know, like mid concert or something where you, then you get like a hole in it and start to catch the strings, stranger. Um, it usually doesn't. Sometimes if it's like really hot and sticky, it'll flake off, mm -hmm. but then you just replace it. Right. But okay. usually, usually never... it'll, it'll last a whole set. And, and... That's interesting. I've never, I've never heard that, that, that technique. It's always been, you know, fake nails or turn a pick you know, regular finger pick around backwards or something. Um, yeah, well, I, I, I've been uh, proselytizing this method for years and <laughs> <laughs> sort of a voice in the wilderness, but yeah. It sounds a lot easier than going to the nail salon. That's what I always felt. And, and, and it doesn't affect your tone or maybe ever so slightly, but most. It doesn't make it too dark. It keeps bright, bright enough. Yeah, yeah, it, it yeah. sounds pretty much the same. I, I want to get to some questions that we have in the chat. We have um, one I see right here um, from Alan Jones. He says to ask you if you have worked with a tenor banjo player, one that does single string Irish tunes and, and how you fit in with that. Um, well, sure. Uh, along the way, uh, I, I used to be friends with uh, uh, a guy in England named Tony Sullivan. He, ran a little company called Hallshaw Music, and he, he was a tenor player. We used to play a lot together when I would visit uh, Manchester. Or, well, actually, he was in Macclesfield, but that, that area. Um, and, you know, at, at, certainly at, at various sessions, there might be a tenor banjo, and, you know, we, we, we could be doing the same thing. Um, uh, I remember uh, one, uh, after one concert, um, um, there's a, a fiddle player and tenor banjo player um, named uh, W.B. Reed from uh, the Seattle area. And I remember one time we were uh, hanging out after a concert and just swapping tunes. So, uh, But it, it's a lot easier to play these tunes on tenor banjo, I have to admit. How do you do when you're playing Irish tunes and Celtic tunes and there's the triplet? Um... How do, how do you get that going? Um, well, um, you know, the triplet on one string, uh, on one note, but you know, okay. like da da da. Uh, well, uh, sometimes I do this.
so that's one way of doing it. Uh, so, sometimes I use uh, uh, left hand uh, um, triplets instead, like, uh, uh, let's see. I've seen some of the younger players come up with interesting solutions that, uh, like doing something like this. So, and then doing an upstroke there. So there, there are all kinds of um, uh, of options. Can you go back slowly and show again what? I do you play that triplet single note right at the beginning just with your right hand oh, like say you're playing yes. playing you know a, a g you know triplet on the g string sure you know um so it's down and then up and then down so i'm using on the upstroke i'm using the back of my nail like a, a flat pick okay you sort of using my nail like a flat pick. so you're going down for the first note is down with your finger and then up, up with the finger. And, and then, then down, down with again. the thumb? No, then down so it's with all, the finger. Oh, it's all finger. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Interesting. So you're you're kind of adding the flat tick flat pick technique a little bit there. Yeah. All right. Cool. That clears that up definitely. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, well, this has been fun. We're we're starting to get towards the top of the hour. Um, uh, any other? Did any other questions come in? Yeah. I want to bring in Jamie because we have he's monitoring the chats a little more than I can see. There he goes. There he goes. Two people playing the same button. Um, yeah. Firstly, thank you so much. I got uh, <laughs> I got visions of you being completely endorsed by Scotch tape now. Uh, as like a, <laughs> a, a signature strip of uh, of, of uh, <laughs> Ken Palm and tape, which is awesome. I, I, I um, once had a, a retired engineer from 3M in one of my workshops. There you go. And he saw me doing that. and He said. That wasn't designed for that. <laughs> <laughs> was like, which, uh, what, what gauge of 3M tape are you using? That's, that's the question. Um, so, I don't know how to pronounce it, but uh, we'll, we'll have a stab. Drew Fugget, I think, says, I'm trying to convert a song by Fisherman's Friends to Clawhammer. I've got the melody down, but I'm having trouble with the phrasing because they fit so many lyrics into a bar. And he says, how would you go about phrasing such a song? Uh... I don't know because I don't know the song. <laughs> Fair but, enough. Yeah. Uh, it, um, if you send me an email, uh, I'll be happy to. Uh, it's uh, Ken Perlman at AOL.com and send me a copy of the song. Presumably, people can reach you through your website as well, right? Or, that's right. Ken, Which is Ken Perlman.com. Ken Perlman.com. Like magic. Excellent. That, that's very kind. Thank you. So I uh, hope you can take him up on that offer. Um, no, just a lot of guys who have been so thankful uh, to you um, for your, your inspiration over the years and um, a lot of people just really, really keen to tune in 
um, onto the uh, into this episode. Um, I know we did have a question that I I don't think Dave got to, but uh, one you you know you know Dan Walsh pretty well, right? Yes, yes. A fellow, uh, he's, a, he's a Deering and Dorsey, uh, and a good friend That's of the right. companies, and um, but uh, a, a wonderful one of our first Deering live guests, actually one of the earliest ones. We should probably have him back on but uh yeah he speaks very highly of you oh great yeah. um tell us how that that relationship came about and kind of how it is now <laughs> in terms of you haven't been traveling there for, for too long i imagine with uh, no with well um th th well it's kind of funny because um for, for some reason uh in the town of uh Cannock, england near stafford in, mm -hmm. in kind of west midlands i guess yeah. um there was a guy named george davies um who is a, a kind of an ex-rocker, mm -hmm. and he decided uh, at some point he wanted to play Clawhammer banjo, and he got so excited about it, and, and he learned from my book, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. But anyway, he decided he was going to teach it, and he had such an electric, uh, warm uh, personality that he got all these local people who had knew nothing about banjos and knew nothing about old-time music to take up the banjo. And uh, so he had, I don't know how many dozens of students, uh, uh, and he was teaching them out of my book. And, and uh, so he contacted me at one point and said, why don't you do workshops? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and like a weekend workshop, and he would get all of his students to come. And for years, I would go over there um, Year, just about yearly, and do that workshop, and that the money from that workshop would pay for the trip, and then I would do some other gigs and go home with something. And so on one of those trips, he said, "Oh, I've got this wonderful young student, young Dan, <laughs> young Dan, yeah. young Dan." So uh, that's how I met. He came to one of these workshops, and he was, yeah. you know, clearly uh, gifted, and uh, yeah. and then. You know, to make a long story short, I mean, at one point his parents said, well, he wants to be a professional musician, and, you know, should he, and that type of thing. And <laughs> say, well, you know, if, he has, if you have to ask, then probably no, but if he really wants to, you know, and then he went to, we well, probably told you the story, he went to Sage Gateshead and uh, was exposed to all this wonderful music, and at one point in the tour, I taught him there, but, um, you know, in, in, in certain directions he's taken it, you know, you know, far beyond where where I was, like he's doing like Indian ragas and you know yeah. all kinds of a lot of uh, original stuff and so you know yeah yeah he, he's he's an awesome he's doing guy some great stuff yeah yeah we we really love we should we should have him back on he's he's a phenomenal talent but uh, I remember Absolutely. him distinctly uh, uh, praising you and like citing you personally as a oh. as a as a major part of that that kind of development of his. Yeah. Um, so and nice. he, you know, he's he's got his own twist on things as well, which is is exciting. It's it's great to see, you know. So uh, let me check. I think that those were the uh, the main questions. But um, thank you so so much today for your time. That was a lot of fun. Okay. Uh, am, I, am, I, am I allowed to to plug an event? Yeah, I was going to say. Uh, you, I know you definitely have some banjo camps to plug, uh, and anything else you want to plug on top of that. You, the the floor is yours. So. Oh, thank you. Could could you just quickly show that picture? Yeah, absolutely. There it is. Thank you. So th these are some of my books and recordings, and the newest one, Appalachian Fiddle Tunes, for Clawhammer, uh, based on um, um, m well, the work I did with Alan Jabour, mostly, uh, that, that uh, repertoire. And, uh, and then you see the book, The Fiddle Music of Prince Edward Island. I spent years collecting tunes up there, and then uh, my latest recording, uh, Frails and Frolics, and, and you'll see some others. And I, I'd like to mention that um, <clears throat> um, I, I give periodic uh, what I call banjo clinics, so you can check that on my website. And uh, Swanee Banjo Camp has just gone online, so uh, our dates are um, uh, March 12 and 13, and, and uh, so swaneebanjocamp.com, Swanee spelled S-U-W-A-N-N-E-E, -E. Um, and then uh, we have Midwest Banjo Camp, we're still trying, to, hoping to go live, that'll be in Michigan, that's in June, okay. and we have American Banjo Camp in uh, near Seattle in September, and we're hoping to go live, so 
you know, hopefully the, the gods will be with us on that. Um, yeah. And uh, so uh, that those are those are my plugs. Um, I love and, it, and, and you have new music out as well. Can people find that uh, on your site as well? Yes, yes, Ken, KenPerlman.com. Let me throw that back up there again for everyone to check out. Uh, thank you. Absolutely, yeah. Um, thank you so much. I, I sincerely hope that, that uh, all of the camps are able to be in person. Um, which, I mean, it's remarkable what we've been able to achieve the last couple of years um, in the face of this thing, but... Uh, it doesn't beat being in person, so hopefully we can get that back, and, and you guys can have some good, some good camps this year. That'd be no, great. Th thanks so much. So, uh, yeah. so did, did you want me to play? Oh, you beat another? me. You beat me to the. Oh, sorry. The punch. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to host the next one? That's fine. Sure. <laughs> Absolutely. No, no. Actually, you guys are doing such a great job. I could never come close. So. Uh, you're all good you're all good so hey uh, here's a thought um, how would you like to play us out with a tune oh well thank you no, um, I'd love to uh, and, and uh, actually uh, we didn't get to touch on my, on my uh, uh, Prince Edward Island work I spent like over you know two or three decades studying the music traditional music there and so I'm going to play a, a medley um, of uh, well, so yeah. before you do that, I'll, yes. I'll make a promise right here, right now. How about we do an episode about that? Sure. Love to. I feel like there's probably quite a lot to talk about there as well. We can probably fit that into another hour. And I'm fairly certain, judging by the chat today, that a lot of people would like to tune in for a dedicated Deering Live on that one. I would love to do that. Um, and, you know, I, with the uh, miracle of modern technology, I can play you all sorts of... Uh, uh, cuts of the fiddle players and then the, the banjo versions thereof. So awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Um, All right. Well, Ken, thank you so much. And okay. uh, I'll let you uh, play us out. Okay. And I want to thank both of you guys. You, you were great. It was a great interview. Thanks a lot, Ken. Thank you. Great question. So here we thank go. You. This is, uh, I'm going to start with, uh, um, start with, uh, uh, an air called Farewell to Kill a Cranky, and then a Strass Bay called uh, Rothy Mercus Rant, and then two reels, the Bonnie Lass of Fishero, and then Kohler's Hornpipe. Might as well check out two.
Thank you.